So uh, we're going to start on slide number 168 for the Cosmic Abandonment Extended presentation this evening. And that slide is part three, the, the third and final part of this presentation called The Unwritten Story of Our Future. Of course, part one was the story of our past, part two was the story of our present, and now we're talking about where do we go from here now that we know the kind of horrific truth about what the origins of humanity was was really like. And, you know, a lot of people will say that the whole interference theory of human origins is kind of like a, a psyop in and of itself. This is one of the things you hear. Anybody that's talking about the possibility of non-human involvement in the events that have taken place on this planet, in the, um, you know, things that were done uh, in the early human uh, time period and, uh, regarding our origins and how we came into the current condition that we've arrived at in the, in the, in the times we're living in, that a lot of people will say that anybody that, that thinks that it had anything to do with non-human entities... Um, or any off-world forces is, you know, somebody who's trying to spread fear and just make it seem so hopeless, make the situation seem so hopeless that people give up. Now, I want anybody to find me ever saying the words, it's completely hopeless in any of the material that I've ever done. Never from day one have I ever put forward that sentiment, and I still, to this day, don't think like that. It can be changed. Our situation can be changed. Our condition can be changed. The question I always ask is, will humanity will it to change? Because it doesn't just change on its own. The, the, the factors that have driven this condition of slavery that we are trapped in, uh, it's not just going to, they're not just going to go away. They have to be addressed. They have to be looked at deeply. They have to be confronted. It's not going to be, we're not going to be able to ignore the causal factors and somehow create the change that we want to see. Reality doesn't work like that. Natural law doesn't work like that. So in this section, what I'm really trying to do for people is to leave them with, with some hope regarding that this situation is changeable. And I hope isn't even the right word to, to use in, in this instance. It's really to help to instill some knowledge in others that the situation is in fact changeable if enough care, attention, and willpower is put into the dynamic of actually changing it through our behaviors. So the first thing we have to understand is I'm, I'm not telling anybody my take on the, the human origins story to make them depressed, to make them disempowered, or the, to make them give up and think that it's hopeless. That's number one. I'm trying to explain these factors because only in knowledge and knowing the truth about what happened to us as a species are we ever going to be able to identify and confront those causal factors head on and then work to change them, to work with that shadow material and not ignore it and not try to run away from it to actually transmute that energy and understand how this condition came about because only when you understand how something a problem actually came about are you in an empowered position to do something about it to change it for the better so that's the whole intent of this entire cosmic abandonment series all right it's to instill that knowledge and then say here's what was done you have to deal with it you can't run away from it. You can't pretend that it didn't go on. It explains just about everything that's happening in the world. If you are being honest with yourself and you really look at it objectively, uh, some people will deny that. Some people will, you know, won't want to look at any of the evidence because of the horrific implications, which I agree are pretty horrific. You know, it's like uh, we were talking about, uh, just as a brief aside, you know, we were talking about uh, allegorical movies. And one of them that I brought up was The Time Machine. And there's a, a, a scene in The Time Machine when... Um, the uh, the quote hero is trying to get information from like a quantum computer or some type of a photonic computer, uh, and the the 
uh, image of the person representing the computer uh, asks him, well, you know, the, he's talking about the rest of the people not wanting to know the truth and therefore they kind of deserve their situation because they're so ignorant. And he was saying, well, you know, isn't that kind of harsh? And he says, well, I want to know the truth. I want to know what happened. And he said, uh, the computer answers him and, you know, kind of says, will you still want to know the truth even if it is so horrific that it will haunt your dreams for all eternity? You know, that's the question. I mean, this situation is not good. It's bad. It, it You know, uh, we were served a raw deal. We were served a bad hand of cards. But, you know, that's, that's you know, as the ball bounces, as the saying goes, that's, you know, the, the deal that we got in life. Now, the question is, are we going to pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, keep getting up, regardless of how bad we've been beaten down, and do something about it? You know, and that's what this section is about. So... Uh, I'll move on to slide number 169, and we're going to start talking about what the process of healing from abuse is all about, because really what ha has been done to humanity is we've been put through a vicious, vicious cycle of abuse, and now we're continuing that pattern. We're continuing the bad behavior of our, quote, cosmic parents who set themselves up as gods here, you know, as our owners, as our masters, and, uh, you know... To get out of that abuse, Vic, to what on earth is happening here on RBN. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. We're talking about healing from the abuse that's been done to our species over thousands, tens of thousands of years, possibly hundreds of thousands of years. And it's a very difficult thing to break out of the cycle of abuse. Uh, as I was saying before the break, it's a narrow pathway to walk because so many factors are against you. See, I covered this before in a, a previous show when we talked about uh, how dominators uh, get to become like that, how they go into that mindset. And it's often because they've experienced um, abuse. It's a very critical thing to understand about the mindset of these people, how sick they are. They're, they're ill people. They're mentally ill people. And they don't understand what is really the underlying psychological factors going on in their mind at a subconscious level at all because they run away from themselves. That's what most people who have undergone severe abuse, that's the pattern they generally fall into. Um, because they've been beaten down so badly. It's where humanity is collectively. So when a traumatic or chronic form of abuse occurs, whether it is experienced directly or it is witnessed uh, being done to someone else, for example, a child witnessing a, for example, uh, their mother being abused by their father, just uh, to throw out an example, you know, um, or whether the child is beaten themselves by one of the parents, okay? The one of the things that usually happens is identification with either the one who is performing the abuse or the one who is being abused. And that kind of, that bifurcation, you know, that choice between which one am I going to identify with? Am I going to identify with the one who is doing the abusive act? And therefore I look at that as, oh, well, that's strength because they're not being hurt. Or am I going to look at you know, well, the victim is being tortured or punished somehow and, you know, doesn't really deserve it. So should I identify with that? When in fact, really either form of that identification is a form of imbalance. Of course, identifying with the abuser is a hallmark of left brain imbalance because then the person usually goes on and becomes abusive. And then identifying with the victim and maintaining a victim mentality is a right brain form of imbalance. So if you look at the chart in, in, on slide number 149, it you know talks about or uh, visually demonstrates this, uh, this bifurcation of identification. So the, the traumatic or chronic abuse occurs, the experiencer identifies with either the abuser, that's that left-hand path that they go down, or they identify with the victim. Then, you know, since they're not dealing with the actual trauma directly, their emotions are either going to turn outward toward other people and they're going to go out and look for someone else to abuse and therefore become the abuser if you follow the flow chart downward. Or on the other side of things, if they identify with the victim 
mentality. Uh, they're, uh, n- the negative emotions that they're trying to suppress will turn inward and then they become a victim themselves and let other people walk all over them. Uh, and in both of these situations, really what's happening is the experiencer of the trauma is doing abuse to themselves because when we're hurting other people, we're hurting ourselves or if we're allowing ourselves to be victimized by others, of course, we're hurting ourselves by not saying no and standing up for ourselves and our rights. So really, this is all about continuing to stay in a state of lack of self-respect, lack of self-knowledge in a state of self-loathing, all things that we're going to talk about later on in this solutions section and uh, put forward some basic uh, ideas to really help people to understand how we can come out of that mentality. And the first aspect of coming out of that mentality is knowledge of self. I, I mean, I can't overemphasize that enough. That's the key to everything because through knowledge of self, you then understand knowledge of your own sovereignty and then you extend that sovereignty out to others because you recognize they're not actually separate uh, from we're not separate from anything we're all part of a living dynamic system which includes everything and um, you know you then uh, exercise the non-aggression principle you exercise the principles uh, of a voluntary society you stop believing in the uh, coercion of statism which is slavery and uh, you know you actually maintain a free uh, a philosophy of freedom in your daily life and actually put that into practice through your behavior through your actions so you know no, it all that all starts with knowledge of self if you don't understand yourself and how you work ultimately you never really truly get to that and whether people develop that knowledge directly or they absorb it you know through like osmosis or uh, it, it happens organically ultimately they somehow understand enough about the self and how they operate to understand those basic principles that i just referred to so Part of healing from abuse is really deeply understanding the kinds of imbalance that lead to a enslaved society, whether it le- it's a le- form of left brain imbalance that leads to what I call master think or a form of right brain imbalance that leads to what I call slave think. Um, either one of these forms of imbalance allows the dynamic of slavery to be perpetuated and to be continued on into the future. So the slide on uh, uh, slide number 170 just again has been part of my work since day one, talking about the basic concepts of the structures of the brain. Again, this is a simplified model. Uh, human neuroscience isn't quite uh, this simplistic. However, the model in general holds true of the triune brain. The three general complexes of the brain being the uh, reptile complex or the R complex including the brainstem and cerebellum, which uh, largely facilitates motor skills and fight or flight um, uh, reaction, survival mechanisms, etc. And then you have the mammalian brain or the limbic system, which generally makes possible emotions by creating the uh, chemicals that ultimately go into the bloodstream and throughout the body and help you to feel something in the physiology uh, regarding what the behaviors that you're taking toward others. And then, of course, there's the human brain or what's known as the neocortical brain, the neocortex, which uh, generally um, governs higher order thought functions, um, both left and right brain, uh, logical and intuitive uh, thought processes, both scientific and creative. So if you're in a state of chronic left brain hemispherical imbalance in the neocortex, we've talked about this many times, what happens is um, it will create a suppression of emotion and a suppression of the limbic brain, and then will eventually be rooted into the R complex of the brain and live like a dominator, you know, wanting to control everything and everyone. It's what I call slave, uh, I'm sorry, it's what I call master think, this form of extreme left brain chronic imbalance uh, toward the logical, uh, you know, uh, side of the brain only, the uh, side of the brain that just deals with um, the physical world, okay, and survival, and you know, 
an- analyzing things and breaking things down. It doesn't ever get into uh, the nurturing and compassion and and creative and intuitive side of, of thought. That's what the right brain does, which you could equally go into a deep form of chronic imbalance if you are too much toward the, the right or feminine part of the brain, uh, just like you can go into uh, the left brain masculine imbalance that leads to slave think. So uh, that leads to master think. So when you go into this right brain form of imbalance, uh, the feminine imbalance, when that part of the brain is chronically dominant, it creates a suppression of the R complex of the brain, where the survival instinct is made possible. And what uh, this form of imbalance does, the right brain imbalance, will it will eventually root us into the mammalian or emotional brain, and we'll be at the you know, we'll be basically a slave to our emotions and we'll constantly be in emotional thinking and reactive mode. Um, uh, and also, it, it, you know, you're always in fear because the fear uh, response also takes place in the limbic brain, as do all other emotions, positive or negative, quote, negative emotions. We'll pick this up on the other side. Stay with us, everyone. What on Earth is Happening? I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. We're talking about where the perpetuation of abuse comes from psychologically. And um, generally, you know, we were looking at slide number 170, and generally what happens is if someone's undergone a lot of abuse early on in life, usually, and again, it could be psychological, emotional, uh, mental abuse, it doesn't have to be physical abuse. Um, uh, it could also just be, you know, not coping with whatever situation life has dealt, and that could be a form of abuse. You know, somebody just not uh, having that internal fortitude and strength uh, or, or support around them to deal with the situation that life has dealt them, and they go into one form of imbalance or another. The left brain imbalanced individuals will identify with the um, abuser. And they become, they take on that master think mentality themselves that I'm going to take control now because I'll show other people, you know, I've been hurt, so then I'll go and hurt others. Um, So they're always looking to control. And the right brain imbalance, uh, the people who are in chronic right brain imbalance, they've also had abuse uh, often in their past and in their childhood. And uh, what they what form that this psychological dynamic takes on in their later years is they will go into this slave think mode where they'll look for protection because they're identifying with the victim mentality. Well, I can't take any action myself. Somebody else has to do this for me. I'm not responsible. That you know, uh, somebody else has to take care of my basic needs or my protection. You know, they, they want to be protected, and so you could see how the whole dynamic of government and slavery is perpetuated through these two dynamics playing off against each other you know it's the it's it could be considered the ultimate dialectic you know it's like a feedback loop you need the masters there to basically be the controllers the people who think they're the masters you know who think that they're in control there are left brain imbalanced um sick individuals that um you know think that they own and have the right to control other people and then you have the people who are willing to lay down to that and never stand up for themselves never stand up for their rights always want this quote protection from you know big daddy government and you know really don't understand human rights and keep uh you know wanting this slavery system to continue you know the the perfect house slave mentality of right brain imbalance and again it's it feeds back dynamically with the the master think uh, left brain form of imbalance so until we understand how that dynamic works we're not putting ourselves in an empowered position to heal ourselves through um, you know exercises and you know ways of healing that deal with this form of brain imbalance and ultimately work to bring it to balance Okay, and I've talked about those modalities of thought in the past. There's many different ways, many different methods, many different programs that people can use to, uh, on a daily basis, bring the brain to a state of balance and keep it there. Again, if there's right brain imbalance, there's concentrative exercises. The left brain form of thought is largely concentration and logic. Somebody who's super right brain imbalance would have to use concentrative exercises in order to bring their brain to a state of balance. If you're super left brain imbalance and you're a control freak, 
um, you know, like many of the police and military individuals out there, you would want to use meditative techniques. Meditation is the right brain form of thought that sl stops the, the mind and the logical and analytical thought and just puts us in this, this state of present moment awareness, being in the now and, you know, looking at ourselves, of just being with ourselves. And I've talked about, you know, the importance of meditation in the past. I've also talked about the dangers of excessive meditation and how the New Age movement uses it uh, to basically get people to stand down and not really take action. Uh, but there is a positive and empowering usage for it, of course. And then the contemplative exercises where you're just actively um, using uh, daydreaming and um, types of uh, visualization techniques to work with both the um, very... Uh, 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 image based and verbal based and, uh, you know, a logical based left brain in conjunction with the creative and intuitive and flowing and, um, you know, uh, 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 open minded aspect of the right brain, uh, to just, um, uh, visualize scenarios and, uh, you know, do things that kind of let you see infinite possibilities. That's what contemplation is ultimately about. It's, it's just working with mental material. It's like an active form of daydreaming. So these, these three modalities of thought, concentration, uh, meditation, and contemplation are all methods of balancing the brain depending on what type of um, uh, inherent situation is already present in the human brain, in the, in the uh, brain uh, complexes. So it's so important to understand this basic knowledge of self and how we work psychologically and mentally in these physiological processes. And it's amazing that none of this is really taught in schools at an early age. You know, th the school system obviously has no vested interest in wanting people to understand themselves because understanding yourself is empowerment and they don't want you empowered. They want you to be a good little slave so you can come out of the school system and just obey and go, you know, do work for whatever my, you you know, uh, faceless corporations that you're going to go uh, beg for work for, uh, worship the almighty dollar and just, you know, uh, spit out children and wash, rinse and repeat the cycle all over again. Um, only self-knowledge is going to ultimately take people out of these forms of imbalance and people have to want to work with themselves. They have to want to know themselves. They have to want to look at themselves and we have to encourage them to do that as conscious people. If you're already conscious and you understand how this dynamic works, you have to share this knowledge with people. You have to put it out there for their consideration in a way that they can understand it. So the second part of this, uh, what I wanted to get into tonight is the concept that regardless of any of the abuse and trauma that we have undergone in the past as a species, consciousness can trump all of that. Knowledge of self Okay, and then putting that knowledge into practical application through enough care and enough willpower, which is what consciousness is really ultimately all about, being aware and then doing something with that awareness, will trump any of that trauma. It will conquer any of that trauma. So what we're looking at has, uh, that has been done in the human past that we've talked about for many, many weeks on this show is genetic manipulation. Uh, a dumbing, literal dumbing down of the species uh, physiologically through genetic splicing and, and modifications and, uh, you know, uh, uh, tinkering that really these beings had no right to do. Now, people will think, well, this is the ultimate code of nature. And, uh, you know, once that's done, there's nothing that can undo it. And it just, it's set in stone. It's set a certain way. It's like a computer code and that's just it. And we cannot possibly outgrow that or, you know, overcome anything that's been done to us genetically. And that mindset is nonsense. It's a Newtonian worldview that is completely out of date in modern science. Most people still think that way because they have bought into this, you know, early, late 1800s and early 1900s model of science and quote unquote evolution, which I talked about extensively at the very beginning of this, uh, you know, extended presentation series, cosmic abandonment, um, that, that this, uh, entrenched model of ancient science of ancient outmoded, outdated scientific thought is still largely entrenched in the public consciousness because newer sciences and newer discoveries within science, 
um, really take a long time to filter their way down from the scientific community into the public's hands. And again, I'm not talking about scientism. I'm talking about real cutting edge science in many cases. It takes a long time to really even come into public consciousness. Uh, years and uh, probably about two decades ago, most scientists said that the gap was over 25 years. Now scientists are saying the gap is almost 50 years, five decades, and that's a conservative estimate. Literally, like what is being discovered in real cutting edge science now will not really be understood. The implications of it may not be understood by the general population for 50 years. And they're saying that that gap widens each day as new discoveries are made. So, you know, when I talk about these, uh, the, the science of epigenetics, most people won't even have heard of it or not have studied into it or looked into it at all. Um, and you're dealt that, those cards and you have to uh, accept that. It's not the case, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we can actually change those things through con I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Just want to uh, make a, a very brief correction. I forgot to mention uh, to get your tickets for the what uh, for the uh, Free Your Mind Three conference. Uh, you can go to freeyourmindconference.com. I forgot to give out the conference website. I believe earlier. Uh, and again, uh, I, I'm highly recommending people to go there who want, are going to attend the conference, uh, even before you make any travel plans. Get your tickets in advance, and uh, I recommend getting the all-weekend pass, uh, only $130 for that package. Uh, that's the early bird special on that. So uh, you could do that right now at freeyourmindconference.com. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in coming weeks, we'll have a, a lot more information on this great event. But Let's go back to the cosmic abandonment presentation. Talk, we were talking about epigenetics in the last segment, and th this comes from uh, Greek and Latin roots, this word. The, the prefix epi, E-P-I, means beyond, you know, or past. So um, what we're talking about here is to go beyond the genes, to go beyond genetics. Of course, genetics comes from the Latin term genere, which means to make or to create. Uh, and... Um, you know, of course, that's what we're made of is our genetic material. And it uh, definitely does facilitate a lot of the uh, characteristics and functions of the being, of course. But um, a lot of people think that uh, it's all set in stone and it's just the card that you were dealt with and you can't transcend any of those characteristics uh, throughout the course of your life. And this is the big lie. This is the big lie put forward by Newtonian science and Darwinian evolution theory, etc. And uh, epigenetics is an emerging science that really shows us that we are actually the writers of our own genetic code in many ways. Okay, it isn't to say we can just snap our fingers and cha you know, uh, you know, uh, grow a sixth finger or something like that. Okay, that's not what I mean by this. It means that if you work in consciousness, if you work with all the aspects of your consciousness, your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions, and you engage the true intelligence, which is a combination of the uh, logical, intellectual side and the creative intuitive side of the mind and you work, you develop true care and then you put you know all of that all of your willpower into actually doing what you know to be the right thing okay and um <clears throat> living in harmony with truth living in harmony with natural law and being unified in consciousness in such that your thoughts your emotions and actions are not uh dualistic or not in opposition to each other and uh, are not inconsistent with each other, meaning as you think, you feel, and so you act. And there's no contradiction there. You are going to be engaging aspects of the life force energy that underlies everything in ways that most people don't think is possible. I mean, here's a simple example, okay? Do you think that the people who are truly aware and whose minds are working correctly and understand what's going on in the world, in life, on this planet, uh, haven't been subject to the same types of physical detriments going on through things like um, chemtrail bombardment in our skies, spraying of heavy metals, okay, uh, the poisoning of the water supply, 
um, the the poisoning of the food supply. You don't think? Look, the the extent that I have awoken my consciousness. Look at all the abuse I formerly did to myself, my body, the types of the type of diet I was on previously. Underneath all of that was still a drive to learn, to grow, to understand truth, to want knowledge, and to want knowledge of self above all. That all of those things, all of those bombardments, which can affect the genetics, which can affect the mind, can affect the brain, still in the long term, because of the persistence that I activated within myself, in consciousness, could not prevail could not keep me down. It kept me down for quite a long time, but eventually the true self burst through and it emerged stronger for the experience actually. And what I'm, what I'm trying to explain to people is the people that think, oh, it's just a hopeless situation because look at how we've been dumbed down. Look at how they've done genetic modifications to us in the ancient past. Yeah, that's it's very dark information. It's very dark knowledge to understand. I personally accept this as what went down in the ancient past okay i think there's enough evidence to prove it personally many people will disagree with that however um it's not something to feel so disempowered about that you give up and you say well since non-human entities are more powerful than us there's no way we could ever rise above this condition you know it's not the case consciousness will trump even all of that genetic modification that was done the thing that has to drive it is care. Again, that's why the image that I picked for epigenetics was an image of all the chakras of a of, of being lit up, these energy vortices that are associated with different levels of glandular activity within the body, within the center line of the body, going up to the, the crown of the head, representing illuminated consciousness. But you, you look at the, the, the chakras, the way they're laid out in, in this image on the right-hand side on image uh, 171 in the presentation slides, and you see that all the energy is focused in the heart, the heart chakra. That you know, this is what I call the eighth principle, the lost principle of the you know um, underlying dynamics of natural law, the underlying principles of natural law. Uh, it's care. That's the generative principle. That's what really is generating everything that comes after that that feeling. Okay, that, that it's a choice of what we want to care about. You know, it's like going back to the, the Matrix movie when Neo's having that conversation with the Merovingian and he's trying to tell him, oh, it's all just about a causality. And Neo, uh, uh, um, the Morpheus character says to the Merovingian, everything begins with choice. It's true. The Merovingian tries to lead him off that path because he's the dark occultist that doesn't want people to understand it's all about free will choice. You know, there is causality. There is natural law at work in the universe. And we are... Uh, bound by that and we have to accept those consequences when we choose a specific behavior or action but it all ultimately starts with choice we have to uh, choose a behavior and then natural law goes into effect natural law consequence goes into effect so what we care enough about to do in the world is ultimately what's generating the condition in the world this is a huge part of epigenetics and what is driving our care well the quality of our mind the quality of consciousness you know that's why the first principle of natural law is everything is mental the whole universe is mind everything begins in mind mind is what's ultimately driving the dynamic of what we care about what we think about drives what we care about and then we behave that's why one is the father, one is the mother, one is a, considered a masculine quality, one's considered a feminine quality, and then, you know, you have the um, behavior is the ch the male child of the byproduct of that quote marriage. This is the trinity. This is what consciousness is all about. So, you know, I, I think it's a very highly appropriate image uh, compared to the very scientific, you know, double helix ladder twisted twisted ladder DNA image there on the left. Um, because it, the energy is coming from the heart. Care is the underlying, um, uh, the underlying dynamic that's going to create anything that we experience in our life. That's why I call it the lost principle, because so many people don't care. You know, that's been lost. It's like the lost word is no. So few people are saying no when their rights are violated that that's considered the lost word. Nobody uses that sacred masculine dynamic of saying enough is enough and I'm not going to take it anymore. You know, they just stand down, you know, 
Uh, and the sacred feminine principle of care is often lost. That's why I call it the lost principle of natural law. So we need to develop that care if we're going to engage epigenetics. Ultimately, it does begin, everything does begin with choice. And that's a mental process, which again is why mind control is such a powerful uh, set of factors when it comes to the controller's um, you know, game plan. Their methods of manipulation to go to work on the human mind so that it stifles the care. And ultimately, they want to destroy people's care. So uh, an individual that I want to just recommend, and again, I can recommend an individual without agreeing with every single thing that he says. Again, people will say, oh, I don't agree with this aspect of his work, so this guy's got to be some kind of an agent or working for the bad guys. Not everybody is going to agree, agree with everything someone says. I don't expect everybody to agree with everything that I say. Okay, I'm pointing out a high quality of work that I feel people will benefit from understanding. And you take what you will from that and you leave what you feel is inaccurate or you know might lead, lead someone astray in a certain way. I think personally certain people in the field of studying uh, you know, consciousness can become a little bit too new agey and too right-brained. I feel the gentleman I'm going to recommend is pretty balanced and is on point when when it comes to his work in epigenetics and what he will pick that thought process up on the other side of this break. Ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening here on RBN. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. We were talking about epigenetics and I was recommending some of the works of Dr. Bruce Lipton. His book, Biology of Belief, I think is an excellent book uh, that talks about epigenetics and the power of consciousness to actually uh, change everything that we are experiencing in life, uh, including ourselves. And, uh, you know, epigenetics means to go beyond the genes, to go beyond the physical matter that we think is just directing everything that goes on here. It's not really the case. It's the facilitator for it. Um, it's uh, what makes the physical experience possible is the genetics. The consciousness is what's driving the genetics. That's the code that uh, ultimately underlies all of it. And we are the, the writers, the controllers, the directors of that code, of that story. And we can change what actually manifests by changing the, the uh, quality of our consciousness. And that's what this book kind of gets into. It talks about how um, human quote, uh, the human condition uh, is di large, very different than what people generally think of as, quote, human nature. I've discussed this a lot in my work where I don't think there is any such thing as human nature as far as being good or bad. Um, it's all about the conditions that result as a result of what is programmed into the individual. If anything, human nature is that we are a programmable species. That is the nature of our actual um, uh, framework, uh, the physiological framework that we are born with, that we can be programmed. The question then becomes, how will we be programmed? What will be programmed into us? What kind of information will we take into ourselves? What kind of information will, information will other people instill? What we, will we take in through food and diet, uh, you know, water, etc.? You know, again, that old adage of quality goes in, quality comes out. Garbage goes in, garbage comes out. Um, in that respect, we are like a programmable computer. If you put a good file format and a good operating system, uh, you know, on the drive and then good programs that are written bug free, then you're going to have good quality output uh, on that computer. If those things are all corrupted, you're going to have terrible garbage output on that computer. Um, humanity is similar to that, not again saying that we are computers, saying that we work like that. So the conditions are going to also influence the result. And that's why they call it the human condition. We improve the, the condition by improving consciousness, which then helps to improve the condition even more. Uh, it's a feedback loop. Again, uh, another big um, uh, aspect of Bruce Lipton's work is the audio series um, uh, wisdom of your cells. Uh, again, I can't recommend that one highly enough either. You have to check that one out. Wisdom of your cells is a great audio series by Bruce Lipton that gets into epigenetics. Uh, I, again, highly encourage people to check out his YouTube videos as well. 
And again, you don't have to agree with every aspect of what the individual is saying in every part of the work that he does. I think these are uh, decent works that he has put out that explain ep epigenetics, and I take that and then move forward with that information. And if he says something I don't particularly agree with, I don't have to accept everything that the man says, nor does anybody have to accept anything that anybody else says. You can take what resonates in truth and you know, set the rest aside, as as they say. So um, that's uh, uh, my recommendation for who you should check out. Um, uh, and there are probably some other people, if you just type in the term epigenetics, I'm sure many other people are getting into this topic now. But uh, Lipton kind of pioneered this, uh, especially as a uh, activist getting out there and uh, giving presentations and uh, talking about this uh, dynamic. Actually got a chance to see him live uh, just uh, outside of Philadelphia in Haverford. And uh, he was, it was a very good uh, lecture that he gave um, near, near Philadelphia um, on this topic of uh, moving beyond, you know, what people perceive as limitations through genes and you know how the whole medical industry is based on this whole uh you know we're going to just affect the matter you know and we're not going to treat the whole being you know we're not going to actually take the whole being into account their conditions their consciousness their state of mind their stress level etc all of that you know it's just like here's a physical mechanism if we can change this we'll change the result well reality doesn't work that way folks we're not just machines you know we're not biological machines this is an old outdated newtonian notion that's been brought into other sciences like the the various fields of medicine and it is an inaccurate paradigm in general it's built upon fundamentally flawed axiom, the fundamentally flawed axiom that matter is superior to everything else, that matter is prime, okay? And as we've talked about here, that's one of the huge things that this currently entrenched paradigm wants people to continue to accept because it doesn't want us to understand the role of consciousness and spirit involved in every aspect of our lives and how it's not really separate from the world of manifested matter, the world of manifested reality. It's what's ultimately driving it. So um, that's really what I wanted to say on epigenetics. And um, I want to get into the things that are going to really be required on our part to change if we're going to change the condition that we have been thrust into. Again, a big part of this is not our, quote, fault, okay? What happened, happened, and it was done by beings that were, um, at that time, uh, certainly technologically superior to us, certainly mentally superior superior or I sh should say just intellectually superior not in real intelligence um, in, not in holistic intelligence because if they had any holistic intelligence they wouldn't have done the things that they did but um, um, I can't let humanity off the hook entirely because we are responsible for the perpetuation of the current human condition because we have not developed the intelligence the care and the willpower to change the current condition we um, simply don't care enough in the aggregate as a species to change what is happening through our behavior and our choices. We, we're in too much fear still as a whole to say this system is junk. It always has been junk. It is junk now. It always will be junk for as long as it is perpetuated. We need to stop fearing the chaos of the collapse of this system we have to allow that collapse to go on you know we need to set up other solutions in uh the process of that coming entropy you know and I i'm all for that chaotic transition personally you know i think that order can emerge for out of chaos i think that the immoral systems that we've built up we have to stop staying attached to and let them fall and then we will build something that is more orderly on the other side. And I'm not saying it may not be a painful, chaotic, transitional period in between. But the problem is, as long as people keep fearing that, slavery is going to continue. You know, I'll take that chaotic, painful transition any day over the continuation of slavery. You know, that's my choice. I'll choose freedom any day. But uh, many people are still too in fear to make that uh, that 
correct choice, that informed and correct choice, that conscious free will choice. You know, they want to continue to look for protection. They want to continue to be dependent. They want to continue to try to absolve themselves or uh, abdicate themselves from their own personal responsibility in life. And when you do those things, slavery is all you can manifest. That's all you're going to get. So what this next section I call um, respect, remembrance, and responsibility. The three R's, okay? Respect, remembrance, and responsibility. Now, what defeats respect, true self-respect, what defeats it is the dynamic of self-loathing. Self-loathing is, uh, and we're on slide number 173 now. What creates self-loathing is for themselves, okay? All bullies are like this. All controllers are like this. All victims are like this. Okay. Ultimately, a bully, a controller, a dominator hates themselves. Ultimately, a victim hates themselves. Nobody who loves themselves could try to push other people around or sit there and take other people's abuse. If you truly love yourself and you're not in a state of self-hate or self-loathing, then you're not going to try to control anybody else, nor you're going to accept somebody else's control. You're not going to play any part of that game. We'll pick this dynamic up on the other side of the break, folks. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. We'll be right back. Here on Republic Broadcasting, I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Before the break, we were talking about the psychological dynamic of self-loathing, just hating yourself. And so many people are trapped in this condition subconsciously, psychologically, and don't really even know it or understand this condition. Um, this is slide number 173, and um, I'll just basically read what's, what's on the slide. It says, self-loathing is the underlying psychological condition that causes people to attempt to abdicate their own personal responsibility to exercise conscience and to fall into patterns of willful ignorance, order following, and the justification of immoral behavior. And that's really what's going on in the world, folks. You know, order followers just doing what they're told, other people putting up with it, people excusing this behavior, thinking that it's okay, that they have the right to do this somehow, offering justifications for it, not exercising conscience, other people trying to hand off or pass on or abdicate their own personal responsibility to do the right thing or to be responsible for themselves to someone else. You know, this all stems from not caring enough about yourself, not having enough self-respect. I'm going to end the presentation part of tonight's show with uh, this topic of self-loathing. And next week, we're going to get into this dynamic of the three R's. Respect, which is what will ultimately heal self-loathing. Remembrance, which is understanding knowledge of self. And responsibility, understanding that ultimately you are truly and totally and ultimately responsible for your own behavior and you cannot pass that responsibility or separate from it or alienate yourself from it in any way and you know those three things really constitute a solution when it comes to a deep understanding of what's going on in our world what's going on within ourselves and uh, understanding the dynamic of natural law so um, continuing with this slide self-loathing is created when earlier trauma or traumas have been suppressed and buried deep into the subconscious mind instead of being confronted dealt with and healed okay working your way out of the um, abuse victim cycle through applied knowledge care and willpower that narrow path that we talked about regarding how to get out of the abuse victim cycle The effects of such unresolved trauma often take the form of feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness, whether real, suggested, or imagined. Again, can a dominator really like himself? And who can like themselves if they don't really know themselves? Who can love themselves if self-knowledge isn't present? Now, could you really love someone you don't know? No, of course not. You have to know them. You have to know something about them in order to express feelings of even like, care, or love. So people don't have a, a, a deep relationship with themselves. And in many cases, that's why they don't love themselves. And they're trapped in this, these feelings of 
inadequacy and unworthiness. And so they either strike out against others or they turn inwardly against themselves and then imagine that they deserve more abuse. Of course, neither one of those things is true. A dominator has no right to do what he's doing. And, you know, somebody sitting back just taking abuse is indirectly doing a wrong and a harm to, to actually everybody around them by not standing up for what's right, for their rights and the rights of other people. You know, people sitting there watching other people be abused or just taking abuse themselves are indirectly doing something that is harmful to others. That's why, you know, I always tell people, people who do not understand human rights, who do not understand the difference between right and wrong, and want to remain in that level of ignorance are ultimately doing wrong to other people. They're, they're, I don't care what somebody does to themselves, their own body, but there are levels of ignorance that you don't have a right to. You know, people say somebody can do whatever they want with their own mind, think whatever they want. Well, that's not really true. It's not really the case. There are, mod there are modalities of thought that are wrong. And that includes condoning violence against other people. That, can, that includes accepting violence being done to people in society in general and saying, I don't care. That's a, an act of violence in and of itself. Not to care about injustices done to other people. You think of it that way, how many people are really doing violence indirectly, indirect violence through their total not caring of what is happening with other people, the injustices that are taking place with others. That person's doing indirect harm because they, by their ignorance, are perpetuating those injustices and allowing them to continue. So, um, the effects of these unresolved traumas take on the forms of feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness, whether they're real, suggested, or imagined. And again, this is on both side, sides, the left brain imbalanced dominators and the right brain imbalanced uh, slave thinkers. Okay, So moving on to slide 174, it's the last slide, and then I'm going to start going to the phones for the time that we have left. Um, I've just lowered prison bars, uh, like the door of a prison over the top of the image that is this golem creature, this totally destroyed, self-loathing individual that says, I have suffered, therefore I shall cause suffering for others. Uh, that is the very dynamic that perpetuates the prison, that perpetuates slavery. Somebody who doesn't care, is only focused on themselves, doesn't care what anybody else is going through, doesn't care what, what injustices are taking place for, toward, toward others, uh, or what's going on in the world, and is totally focused on me, 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 which is Satanism, thought process, it's satanic thought. Uh, m most people are in this modality of satanic thought. From the minute they wake up, they think about nothing but themselves. They don't get involved in, um, you know, uh, communicating knowledge to anybody else. And that very dynamic of I'm only concerned about me, and since I've gotten a raw deal, I'm going to treat other people the way I was treated instead of treat them the way I would rather be treated, um, then that's what perpetuates the dynamic of slavery and, and imprisonment and disempowerment. Next week, we're going to get into, again, the three R's, self-respect, self-knowledge, remembering who we are, and personal responsibility. These are the things that heal self-loathing and bring about true self-love so that we can affect a solution, understand our own sovereignty, understand how natural law works, and then live our lives in harmony with it, and ultimately end slavery by doing so. So uh, with that having been said, I'll, I'll leave it for there, and hopefully next week we can wrap up the official part of the presentation, and then in coming weeks we'll move on to some supplemental material regarding cosmic abandonment, and then future weeks I'm going to be moving into uh, um, some of the dynamics of uh, order followers and their thought processes and what we need to do to try to change their state of consciousness uh, or influence a change in their state of consciousness. I'm going to talk about some other social dynamics uh, down the line that are going on in society that are uh, really negatively affecting our society and keeping it where, where it's at, which is exactly where we don't want it to be, uh, which is a state of slavery and disempowerment. We're talking about the over the underlying condition of self-loathing as being one of the prime psychological conditions that causes people to continue to accept and remain within the state of slavery as a species. Slide number 174, I have the uh, 
the slide is about self-loathing and I have the image up there of a golem creature, a creature that's made by someone else, a creature that doesn't even think its own thoughts, has uh, animation kind of breathed into it by its master and it's just a, like a flesh robot and it's saying I have suffered and therefore I shall cause suffering unto others. You know, what is that a being that cares about itself? Is that a being that uh, really has any developed self-respect? You know, no, it's, it's a being that is ultimately trying to say, I'm not truly responsible for what I do or what I cause in the world, for what I put out there into the universe, and they think good things are going to happen to them. Doesn't work that way, folks. Not according to the principle of correspondence under natural law. What we put out is what we're going to receive back from the universe. You know, so as long as we're in a condition of self-loathing, expect more suffering heaped down upon you because of how you think about yourself. Self-loathing is the underlying psychological condition that causes people to attempt to abdicate their own personal responsibility to exercise conscience and to fall into patterns of willful ignorance, order following, and justification of immoral behavior. Only a self-loathing individual will fall into those patterns. Willfully remaining ignorant, continuing to do things that they know are just horrible for them, following orders of other people who they think somehow know better than them, and they just want to follow them because they don't want the responsibility of choosing right over wrong for themselves, and justifying their continuation of their, their choosing of immoral behaviors. Self-loathing is created when earlier trauma has been suppressed and buried into the subconscious mind. In order for someone to truly hate themselves, there had to be a, something traumatic happen to them. And they don't want to deal with it at a conscious level. They want to bury it into the subconscious, keep it there, and never deal with that uh, shadow psychological material. Again, the brilliant... Uh, teacher Michael Tessarion has likened this to continuing to eat off of a dirty plate day after day after day without doing any of any cleansing in the mind. He likens, you know, compares the word uh, sanity with sanitation, both referring to cleanliness. To clean up something is to make it sanitized. Well, that's what we have to do to the mind to make the mind sane. You know, we need to work with that shadow material, clean it up, deal with it, confront it face it, recognize its presence, and then work with it. We don't want to do that. The mind's going to remain in a totally deplorable condition. And it's going to be largely operating at the level of the subconscious. And therefore, it's going to own our behavior without even us really consciously being aware of it. And then we just fall into the same patterns over and over again. So, so self-loathing is created when this earlier trauma has been suppressed and buried into the subconscious mind instead of being confronted, dealt with, and healed. The effects of such unresolved trauma often take the form of feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness, whether real, suggested, or imagined. And I want to focus on that term, unworthiness, because that is the key the thing that we have to overcome as a species. So many people think that humanity's nature is this way, is what we have allowed to basically happen to us, to, to the state that we've allowed ourselves to come into. And it's not our nature. It's our condition. There's a huge difference between the nature of something and the condition it happens to be in. You know, you could take a silver coin that its its basic nature is it's made of silver. But if that coin's extremely, extremely tarnished, you can't maybe maybe can't even tell that it's made of high grade, high quality silver. Okay? I mean it's just an example. It's not saying that that has any actual intrinsic value. What has real true intrinsic value is human beings. You know, we are the thing that we have to consider truly worthy. Of infinite worth. As, as I'm going to get to, you know, that's the, that's the key to all of this is a total reevaluation of what it really truly means to be a human being and stop, you know, having this negative poison worldview that human nature is somehow demonic or, or horrible or evil when that's not the case at all. Now, that's not to say let people off the hook for their immoral behavior because they've been conditioned into accepting things as they are. 
we should be striving to change that because that can be changed. So, you know, it all comes down to healing that self-loathing, which is what we're going to talk about today. And the only force that really counters self-loathing is self-respect. And self-respect is about moving to a different perspective. The word respect is derived from the Latin prefix re, meaning again, and the Latin verb spectare, meaning to look at, to look upon, to look at. So we put them together, re, again, and spectare, look at, respect, to look at again, to take another look at. Well, what are you taking another look at? Of course, for self-respect, you have to take another look at yourself, reevaluate yourself, honestly, without lying to yourself, and say, what have I allowed myself to become? What condition have I allowed to take root? And if you honestly want that condition to change for the better, then you have to develop self-respect by looking at it, not trying to push it away, and then working with it. Working with that painful shadow material, which, and there's the problem. Most people don't want to do that. They'd rather try to run away. Well, there is no running away from it. How could you run away from the self? You can, it doesn't make a difference where you go. It's going to be there with you because it, it is you. So good luck trying to run away from it. Good luck taking the escapist approach. That's what religionists do. That's what New Agers tend to do. You know, and I'm not making a 100% general, 100% blanket statement. I'm saying, saying that as a generality. The very right brain among us often fall into that, that trap. And, you know, the dominators of the world are both left and right brain imbalanced. That's what people have to understand. They're left brain imbalanced when it comes to the, you know, outlash that they want to take against other people you know, for them hating themselves, you know, they think they're in control of other people, this petty sense of illusory power that they derive from, you know, doing violence unto other people. But then you have to understand they're also in a very twisted right brain imbalanced mindset as well, because they hate themselves. They have no true self-respect. They don't have any knowledge about the self and they're willing to basically subjugate themselves and enslave themselves to whoever's giving them their orders as long as it means I don't have to think for myself and I don't have to engage my own personal responsibility and my own personal judgment to choose from the, the to, to choose the difference between right and wrong behavior for myself as an individual see when when you really start to gain true self-respect you look at yourself and you say is the action that I'm taking does it fall within the parameters of natural law as something that I have a right to take? Is it an action that does not cause harm to others and therefore it's a right? Or is it something that does do harm and violate others and therefore it's a wrong? We'll pick this up right on the other side of the break. Don't go anywhere, folks. Solutions to overcoming the current human condition of slavery because only people that don't have a truly developed sense of self-love could continue the condition of slavery to continue to perpetuate it or could continue to accept it. And that's the thing, that's the harsh truth that most people don't want to hear and hate me for saying. But it's true nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen. Only a species that hates itself could allow itself to remain enslaved and participate in its own enslavement. And if you just sit and think about that statement for a little while, quietly with yourself, you'll realize that it cannot be any other way. Therefore, the solution is love. But the solution is self-love before any other form of love. You have to come to a personal relationship with yourself by looking at the shadow material, only self-respect can heal self-loathing and therefore to help to put humanity on the path to healing and conscience and freedom. Nothing else can do it. And let me tell you what the deep inner knowledge, the core underlying truth, principle, if you will, that has to be understood when it comes to the dynamic of self-respect as being the thing that can heal self-loathing. You have to understand that the value of the individual is infinite. 
that the individual has infinite worth. It's not about a group. It's not about society. It's not about anything else but understanding. If you take hold of your infinite value, the infinite worth of the self, and you recognize that there's nothing that is more important than that, you're going to be on the path to healing, to understanding, and ultimately to true freedom. But so few people care enough about themselves in that regard to want to look at the things that are uncomfortable about themselves that they want to try to run away from, that they want to try to escape. They think that they can keep pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off. Well, eventually that big beast comes up from behind you and he eats you when that's your attitude about that shadow material. It doesn't go away. It grows and it becomes more and more powerful as you ignore it. This is what all the order followers have done. This is what all the willing slaves have done that perpetuates this condition. The super left brain among us, the order followers that want to just do harm to other people because they think that they can and they can get away with it. All the people who want to sit back and take it and say, oh, we just need to watch. You know, we just need to sit back and see how it all plays out. You know, not even being active participants in life. What can I do mentality? You know, I don't want to get involved mentality. All right brain imbalance. And then these two imbalance dynamics play off against each other to create a world of total enslavement. And all of this, because yeah, it stems from what originally had been done to us in the past. But as I said, we talked about all of that. We brought out all that shadow material. We brought out all those things that, those nasty things that nobody wants to talk about or even consider that has happened to the human species over vast stretches of time. Genetic manipulation, enslavement, you know, being made to think of other beings as, as gods somehow that have some kind of a actual right to rule over us. And then perpetuating that system down through government and religion and kingship, etc. Those systems being handed down to us by those beings. And you can you know, make the argument, oh, this was done to us. But like I said, this is the solution section. This isn't about crying in our milk, folks, you know, as a little kid. You know, our childhood's over. Now it's time to actually recognize what's been done and man up and deal with it. And say, hey, this is reality. This is how it really went down. What are we going to do about it now? No use living in the past. And saying, woe is us. It happened already. Nothing you could do about the past. The past is done. It's that which is. It's the truth. You either recognize it and accept it and then move on and do something about it. Or you live in a state of denial. This is about looking at the truth. Recognizing it's, it's a horrible condition. And saying, but what are we going to do about it now in the present moment where all power lies to create change? to create positive, lasting change. The answer is recognizing the infinite value of and infinite worth of the individual. See, that, that's what, if people ask me one of the things that brought me up out of my grave, out of my total unconsciousness, that was it. I was laying there in total depression, recognizing what I had partaken in, recognizing what kind of a, a person I was. And I said, well, you could deal with this two ways. You could lay down and die and let the world beat you. Or you can say, I'm worth more than this. They didn't beat me. They may have used me for a time, but I love myself more than that. And I'm going to rise above that condition because I have the strength and I have the willpower and I have the self-motivation and I have the self-love to do that. These are what the solutions are. So, you know, th this is all about that one overarching principle. The infinite worth of the individual, the infinite worth of the self. So that's slide number 175 about self-respect. And you could put the word self-love in, in place of that. They're equivalent as far as I am concerned. Self-respect is self-love and vice versa. 
because it is turning the attention toward what really matters, what's going on within. And ultimately, that's a process of remembering. Again, this is the three R's, respect, remembering, and responsibility. When you start looking at the self, you start to discover what the self really is. The deep core aspects of it that underlie consciousness, that are the expressions for consciousness. Again, people will say, you know, the ancient mystery traditions have said, to know the self is the ultimate commandment. You know, that's what we're here for. It's the ultimate dynamic that's going to bring about healing and freedom. That's why it was kind of their mantra, you know, know the self, know the self and you will know the universe and the gods. Only knowledge, the knowledge of truth is going to set us free. That's it. Nothing else can do it. So this is a process of remembering who we actually are. That we are a byproduct of our thoughts, emotions, and actions. That's ultimately what we express in the world. That's how our consciousness expresses itself. And either we come to a f fulfillment of those aspects of consciousness or we fail to develop them. Again, I really like the way the teacher Michael Tessarion, teacher, researcher, kind of has this idea that we're here to develop a soul. A lot of people insist we have a soul or we are a soul. You know, maybe we're here to work upon the soul to develop it further. You know, it's not just a static thing. It's something that you work upon like a, a sculpture of some kind. And you put the more energy and attention and focus you put into it, the better it becomes. So if we work with the thoughts, emotions, and actions, and we develop them to their full potential, we're developing the soul. And if we don't, we're going down deeper and deeper into darkness. And that suffering and that pain, is good. we're going we're to have to learn through that pathway, that dark left-hand path. Instead of taking the straight, albeit quite narrow, road directly to the truth. If we develop our thoughts, we arrive at knowledge. We arrive at a deep understanding of what is going on around us and why we're here and who we really are. And then we will ultimately use that to do the right thing in the world, which is what wisdom is all about, right action. If we fail to develop our true holistic intelligence, we're going to be stuck in a condition of ignorance, which is where most of humanity is, clinging to illusion, vested in the illusion wanting to prop up the immoral system that exists all around them, believing in fa the false I idol of money above everything else, and authority. 100% lost in the land of illusion attached to things that don't even really exist in nature. We'll pick up this all-important process of remembering. It's all about knowledge of self, folks. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio, my website, whatonearthishappening.com. We're talking about solutions to the human condition of slavery. And we talked about self-respect and recognizing the infinite worth and infinite value of the individual as being one of the underlying psychological conditions that really has to be developed in order to counter the self-loathing that is so prevalent in today's society that gets people to accept and participate in their own enslavement. Uh, we're on slide number 176 of the Cosmic Abandonment presentation talking about remembering the knowledge of oneself and the expressions of human consciousness, the true holy trinity of thought, emotion, and action, or as it has been known, mind, spirit, and body. And we have to bring those together such that they are not in contradiction, such that as we think, so we feel, and so we act. As we think in the mind, so we feel through our emotions, the spirit in which we take our actions, and then so we act with the body. And those three elements of consciousness are in non-contradiction, unity consciousness. 
again, we were talking about, you know, the fulfillment of these expressions of consciousness versus their failure or the uh, inactive uh, aspects when we don't put these to their best use in the world during the time that we have. So, you know, in thought, we can come to knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, or we cannot actively engage our holistic intelligence and remain in a state of ignorance, foolishness, and naivete, believing anything that is put out there for us to believe, refusal to look at information that is out there that can help us to understand what's going on. Most people aren't nescient because there's plenty of information out there. They're ignorant. They will willfully ignore the truth. Because they have this idea deep down nested in the subconscious mind. If I'm ignorant, I can't be made to be responsible for what's going on around me. And that's folly in and of itself, that kind of thinking. We're responsible regardless of whether we know or not. Because the truth was out there. It was all around us at all times. If you didn't take it into yourself, that's, that's on you. You know, the emotional aspect, the emotional expression of consciousness... Its fulfillment is what I have called true care, the generative principle, empathy for all, you know, the high, high expression of love, not the, you know, bodily or just romantic love, not even just, you know, mental, you know, deep understanding or affinity with a concept, not that kind of love, but the fully open and expanded form of love known as agape which is care for all care of injustice going on anywhere because if it's taking place even with one individual it's happening for all the understanding that as one suffers all are suffering true compassion true care that's the generative principle of the universe. That's what drives everything ultimately. The failure of this, of course, is apathy, indifference, callousness. How much callousness and apathy is going on in society? How many people just don't care about the injustices or sufferings or just just the everyday, uh, you know, things that people are that is uncomfortable for people that they happen to be going through. How many callous people are out there that just try to go by whatever corporate policies are out there and don't treat people as human beings? You see this constantly every day. They've just become so callous to people around them that for a paycheck, you'll just do whatever some heartless corporation commands of you to do. And try to blow it off and justify it like, that's just what I do for a job and this is just this isn't who I am this is just what I do it's just I'm making a living nonsense you're putting that energy out into the world through your behavior it is becoming who you are you're allowing that to become who you are I'm not telling anybody you are your job I'm saying that's what they're in that's the attachment the mindset they're in with that kind of an attitude that I don't care about how, how this affects others that kind of callousness in the world. And it's all too prevalent. And there's all way too few people who are willing to call people out on that BS that they exhibit in their everyday lives on a daily basis. And get up in their face about it. And tell them it's not acceptable. And then the, the final expression of the remembering of who we are in consciousness is our actions with the behaviors we actually put out into the world that affect not only ourselves but other others around us the fulfillment of which is courage willpower the development of the will the true will and persistence never giving up never giving in never allowing this world to defeat you and put you down and take you off the battlefield take you off the field of action that takes tremendous courage you know what it takes way more courage to uh, to exercise the willpower and persistence to renew the resolve to continue to do that work 
That takes way more courage than ever even beginning it. Let me tell you something, folks. The day I began doing what I'm doing, I, I tossed the die. The die is cast already. I knew what I was getting involved in. I knew the enemy I'm facing and up against. I know it definitively, definitively because I worked with them. So there's no doubt in my mind the kind of evil I'm up against. None. And let me tell you something. It's way more, it takes way more courage and way more willpower to continue to do that on a daily basis than it ever did to start doing it. When you start doing it, you start to develop that will even more. That's what it's, it's like any other task. You want to get good at it? You got to practice. You got to keep doing it over and over and over again. It's like playing an instrument. You know, getting good in anything, computers, you name, you name the skill, art. The failure of the active component of consciousness is when we are lazy, cowardly, and submissive. You know, we let people push us around and we stop trying and we say, that's too hard or I don't want to do that. Laziness, cowardice. And just laying down to the control system. That whole mindset. What can I do? Plenty. You can get involved in any one of tens of thousands of areas that can help the cause of human freedom. It's, a, it's about asking what help others need for at first. Or just going out and finding something that you're good at doing and then just doing it. It's real simple, folks. There's nothing to it but to start doing it. You know, and you'll build yourself up as you go. I talk about constantly how I feel I waited too long to even start talking about all of these topics with what I knew previously. At least, at least I finally did get up and start doing it. So the question becomes on this chart on slide 176, you know, which column do you want to fall into? You know, what do you want to be said when you're, when you're gone and you're no longer in this world? Do you want it to be said that you were a person who fulfilled those expressions of consciousness or one who ended up as a total fail? That's all it really comes down to. I know I won't be able to look back on what I did here on earth and say I did nothing. I know it will go on to affect other people and it will have a remission of that word, that all-important word sovereign on the other side as we wrap up the extended cosmic abandonment presentation. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. What on Earth is Happening right here on RBN. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Tonight, we are wrapping up the extended version of the cosmic abandonment presentation. At some point in the future, I am going to go back and start to uh, present some source material on some of the information within the Cosmic Abandonment presentation. However, I feel that this is probably a good time to start uh, jumping off into topics that I've really wanted to be talking about and covering, um, you know, on what on earth is happening for a while. And um, some of the issues that I'm going to be getting into is uh, order following. It's going to be my topic at the Free Your Mind Conference. I think this is something that really, really has to be deeply understood where this comes from. It has to be understood that we have to reach the minds of these house slaves of society. You know, I'm just going to come out and call them what they actually are. Until you reach their minds, we're not going to be making any progress. You know, or, you know, what is going to have to happen is going to be really horrific that is going to be something that people can scarcely even imagine to secure any modicum of remaining freedom that is left in, in this, on this planet for human beings. But if we can reach the minds of these order followers, maybe we could change the result for the positive without having to go down the path of bloodshed. But um, I'm also going to be getting back into the importance of gun ownership and restressing that repeatedly on this broadcast and really helping, trying to help people to understand, you know, 
the concepts of how important the, the people who originally created this country and essentially were, you know, not all the way enlightened, but we're trying to help get, give people some modicum of an, of an idea, of an understanding of what it meant to be a free, free being. And again, you could make all the claims that you want and say everything about how, you know, well, they didn't support this for all people. And yeah, I get that. And yeah, we, we also engaged in conquest of this territory, of this actual physical land. And I guarantee you, <laughs> there are, Sons and daughters are still paying the, the brunt of the, the karmic consequence for them doing that. But my whole point here is through the idea of self-ownership and the ownership of the ability to defend yourself through weapons, you know, and the importance of the, of the understanding of the Second Amendment, the concepts laid down in it, the importance of understanding what the militia even is. I'm going to be going back into that material again because I don't think it can be overemphasized, particularly at the time in which we are living. You know, and I said at the end of my uh, demystifying the occult seminar, folks, if you're unarmed at this point, you're a very naive and even stupid individual. I'll come right out and say it. You know, I, I think at this point it's more important to be armed than it is to have food on the table. That's how important I think firearms ownership is at the point in which we are living in history. So, you know, that's another topic I'm going to get into. And, and yet another topic I'm going to be getting into when I talk about, you know, order followers is how important the awakening of women to the truth is going to be in helping to get these order followers out of their mindset. And, you know, I'm going to say some unpopular and controversial things when I start talking about the mindset of women in our culture in the, the modern day and how deeply the cultural conditioning affects them, even in many cases, much more so than it is affecting the male population. I'm not saying both contingencies are not super brainwashed, but I'm going to specifically get into the, the mind control targeting of the f female population. So it should be quite interesting and even controversial topics that are going to be brought up on this radio show in the coming weeks and months, as I stay on those topics probably for months. So for now, I just want to uh, briefly make one more quick event announcement, then I'm going to jump back into the uh, material, and then I'm going to take your calls in the last couple segments. But um, I just want to mention to everyone that I was interviewed on the Vinnie Eastwood show this week on um, Wednesday night, November 19th. Uh, it was a roundtable discussion with a few other individuals. Bill Turner took part in it, Clint Richardson, and of course Vinnie Eastwood. And uh, we talked about the pros and cons of the uh, free man on the land movement and the straw man slash legal fiction, uh, you know, the separating from the legal name and legal fiction concept. And, um, you know, I think that uh, just, I'll, I'll just let everybody know that interview is posted on my website in the news section where all my radio interviews are posted. Uh, I definitely encourage people to download that and check it out. I just, you know, think that I was, you know, once again, when it comes to a lot of these roundtable discussions, I see myself as the most extreme individual uh, from my standpoint of freedom. And it's like, you know, I don't think our freedom needs to be negotiated with anyone. It's already our possession. We need to secure it. The end. You know, that's it. You need to be willing to do what's necessary to secure what's already yours. Isn't that what responsibility for something is? That's my definition of responsibility. It's a huge part of my definition of responsibility, you know? And it comes down to this notion of remembering who we are to go jump, you know, use that as a springboard to jump back into the, the, the material. On slide 177, I, I explain the word sovereign. The word sovereign is derived from the Latin adverb super, meaning above, and the Latin noun regnum, meaning rulership or control. So we put them together. The, the first part of the word sovereign, sover, comes from the Latin super, suver, meaning above. And then reign, the word reign, comes from the Latin regnum, R-E-G-N-U-M from the Latin rex regis, meaning king. Regnum is the rulership of the king or the control of the king. His control or rulership. 
Thus, a sovereign means one who is above control, super regnum, above control, not a subject to control, not a subject to the rulership of another, one who is above the rulership or control of another, or in other words, in one word, someone who is free. And people still don't understand this. You say the word sovereign to them. Are you sovereign? Well, if the answer is no, that means you've just said you're a slave. The, the, if somebody says, are you a sovereign? And the answer comes back, no. The next question should be, well, then who owns you? Because what you're asking is, do you own yourself? When you ask somebody, are you sovereign? You're saying, does someone else have ownership and rulership and control over you? And therefore, are you their property? essentially. You know, if somebody says they're not sovereign, that's basically what they're admitting. Oh, you are owned by someone else? Well, you, could you please then tell me who, who your rightful owner is in the natural world, in reality, who actually owns you and is responsible for what you think, feel, and do? You know, that, that's the next question that should be asked. Because what sovereign means is free, above the rulership or control of someone else, not under... The, uh, under jurisdiction of someone else, not someone else's subject, not someone else's slave. Sovereign means free, not a slave, a free being. And by that definition, all beings in the universe are sovereign beings because there is no such thing as legitimate slavery. All claims of slavery are inherently illegitimate. Meaning all claims of slavery are morally wrong. All conditions that, you know, take on the form of slavery are morally wrong conditions and are therefore invalidated. The problem is so many people continue to give validation to the slavery system by even being willing to, to negotiate with it. And therein lies the problem. They don't understand their sovereignty. Moving on to slide number 178. And, you know, that, that knowledge, that part of self-knowledge is part of the remembering process. You have to get to a point where you know, you remember, oh, I'm a free being. I always have been a free being. But I've just been accepting this condition of slavery and, in many cases, participating with it. Talking about participating with it, you know, slide number 178, you know, has the, the most least mature and the most responsible people among us that are responsible for the perpetuation of the human condition of slavery, namely the police, regardless of what their own responsibility. They own it whether they want to or not. One can only make a claim that they can abdicate that. We'll pick this up on the other side, folks. You're listening to What On Here on RBN. Continuing with the extended cosmic abandonment presentation, I'm going to attempt to wrap it up this evening. We're talking about the three R's, self-respect, remembering who we truly are, and personal responsibility. This is what is going to get us out of the current human condition of slavery, ultimately. And they are all things that we have to work with individually in our own psyche. It's not a external solution. It's not an external thing, folks. If you're expecting that, you're expecting what is never going to ultimately happen. People have to heal themselves because they care enough about themselves to do it and they take the personal responsibility to develop the knowledge that can heal them. We're talking about that personal responsibility. And the people who don't want it more than anybody else, who think that they can pass the buck on to someone else who's giving them an order. It's just my job. I'm just doing my job. I'm just following my orders. No, you're just being a good little Nazi slave. You know, you're just be being a, a, a good little house slave. That's what you're really saying. And think about it. Can somebody who accepts slavery for themselves and others really care about themselves? Are they a real man? Is that a real man? Is that what a real man is? Has nothing whatsoever to do with being a real man. You're so attached to the system. You're so worried about chaos. I'm so worried about the bad guys. I mean, you, these people sound like little, tiny, little boys who, who, whose, whose mommy and daddy d didn't pay enough attention to them, didn't give them enough love, you know? 
I'm worried about the bad guys out there. You're working for the bad guys out there, clown. You're already working for them. You're working for the demons of this world. News flash for you. And you're so stupid you don't even know that. Because your face hasn't seen the inside of a book since you were in kindergarten. That's the problem with these people. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm not going to be ruled by dumb people who don't want personal responsibility for themselves and are afraid of danger lurking around every corner. Because that's no real man. So they're certainly not going to rule me. You know, that's all I'm saying. You know, my die has been cast a long time ago, though, folks. I don't really care anymore, you know, about what I say. Because I'm not going out. If I'm going to go out of this world, I'm not going out of this world quietly. Let's just leave it at that. I'm certainly not going to go out at the hands of, you know, in the dynamic of laying down to little boys who aren't even real men. You know, they're so attached to this system that they're willing to give over their life for something that doesn't even mean anything. All it ever has meant is slavery. You know, people think that they're good people, that they care about themselves. They don't care about themselves, let alone anybody else. And yet, these, these are the people who serve the gods of old. You think people like this didn't exist tens Hundreds of thousands of years ago. They served the beings who came down here and told us we're your gods. Same kind of people serving those demons then. As are serving the modern demons of the world. The progeny of those beings that came here and did what they did to us 100,000, 200,000, 400,000 years ago. Nothing's changed because the mindset hasn't changed because these people still hate themselves, still think that they're, they're not worth more, still want to accept the condition of slavery, still want to abdicate something that can never actually be abdicated, your own personal responsibility to choose right from wrong for yourself. You can only make that claim that you could abdicate personal responsibility for moral choice to someone else. This can never actually be done in nature. Your individual personal responsibility for your own behaviors always remain your own property. That always remains with you and can never be given to someone else. So responsibility isn't how much money you make. Can you put food on the table? Can you have this kind of a house or this kind of a car? That's not what real responsibility is. I hate to burst the bubble of idiots and morons out there who think that that's what the measure of personal responsibility is because it is not and never was. The measure of personal responsibility is how much knowledge do you have about what the difference between right and wrong behavior is and how much are you going to accept that the choice of actually making that behavioral decision always lies with you as an individual and can never be put off to any other individual. That's what real responsibility is. It's accepting conscience and saying, I'm going to accept that this is the judgment that I have to be making. I have to weigh these actions in the balance and say, is that action a human right under natural law? And if it's, the answer comes back no, I'm not going to take that action for any amount of compensation, for any promises, for any condition, for any amount of comfort, and certainly not for any amount of money. That's what being a real man is. That's what being a real woman is. Taking that as your own property, your own responsibility. So at the bottom of this slide, I've just simply put, you know, three sentences. Grow up, think for yourself, and stop following orders. That's how you'll know you've entered cosmic adulthood. When you recognize following any orders, doesn't matter who they're coming from, is utter childishness, utter slavery. And you're not only putting yourselves in those chains, you're putting your children and those who come after them in, in, in those chains that you have forged. 
Slide 179, regardless of how troubled it may have been, humanity's childhood is over. The past is the past, folks. I, you know, this section is not to beat people down further. It's a solutions section. It's to explain to you what was done is done. Now, you, you got to accept it and live in the present moment as any other trauma. Okay, did trauma happen? Yes, it did. Well, we have to accept that. There's not, the past cannot be altered. The question becomes, what are you worth? Are you worth picking yourself up and dusting yourself off and then moving forward? Is the measure of yourself as an individual going to be not how many times life has beaten you down, but how many times you're going to get back up and say, take your best shot again? See, because my worth, as I see it, is infinite. I'm not just going to sit down and lay down to slavery. And that's what reversed, that re- realization is what reversed my mindset. And it all came full circle back to the self. But not in the way that I originally saw the self. Saw it in a whole new light. And it wasn't about just serving personal selfish interest anymore. It was about knowing the truth and helping other people to understand it as well. To get into the slipstream of the will of creation and do that great work fearlessly, regardless of what happens to the flesh. That's what the work, the soul work is. The soul journey is to do that work. And as you do that work, you're working upon the soul. Our choice as a species, ladies and gentlemen, is to accept cosmic adulthood or perish. To accept it and enter it. Because we are not children anymore. We're adolescents trying to move into adulthood that have really screwed things up and kept them in a screwed up condition. Yes, again, trauma was done to us. Accept, I accept that. I, I recognize that. But that doesn't mean you sit there and you keep beating up on yourself, never develop self-respect, never develop self-love, never develop personal responsibility. It means you recognize something bad happened, but... I have more worth than to let that beat me down and hold me down. And so therein lies the choice. Do we grow up as a species? Because the only other answer is (laughs) we're going away as a species. That's the only other real choice. So is there a choice involved is the question. I guess that is a choice. You know, do we have enough self-respect to dust ourselves off from the trauma that happened and say, what are we going to do about this now? Are we worth more than this condition? And we either choose to do that work upon ourselves to help others come out of this conditioning and change the dynamic that's going on 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 this planet or we're going away permanently, folks. Final thoughts for the extended cosmic abandonment presentation. As I said, humanity's uh, troubled childhood is over. And we are in our cosmic adolescence moving toward cosmic childhood. And the answer is to stop believing in all the illusion and fantasy that we've been fed regarding authority and money and religion and all the other systems of enslavement that we are completely attached to and controlled by. They only ever have been systems of control to limit us and to make us look at our self-worth as being limited when in fact it is of infinite value. Slide 180, the, the ultimate answer is the deep understanding of natural law and its underlying principles. The, the objective, inherent, in nature difference between right and wrong behavior. Conscience. The ultimate sovereign on the throne of the universe that will never be and can never be dethroned. The boundary conditions that ultimately govern nature and govern the behavioral decisions of the individuals within it. That's the key to everything, folks. Slide number 181. It's the key. Natural law and its understanding is the key 
that can unlock all the locks on all the doors to all the cages of all the prisons everywhere in creation. That's how powerful that knowledge is, which is why it is the most occulted knowledge. All of the other things, all the other distractions, all the movements, all, you know, the, 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 the heroes and, and, you know, uh, saviors coming to rescue us, all those distractions, all the new age nonsense, you know, re, you know, the re religious nonsense of the new age and other world religions, you know, all the other distractions and minutia are all there to detract from someone's attention so that they do not get to an understanding of natural law. It's all it comes down to so that they do not understand what rights are and what they are not. When we get that key and actually put it into the lock on this world and turn it, we will end slavery on this planet. And that key is natural law. And that's what our mission was here to do, folks. Slide number 182. Our mission here on earth, we came here to end slavery. You know, we took a mission when we incarnated on this world. And we thought, oh, we can get this done. Then we come into the world of forgetting and the world of illusion where the conditioning is so strong from our birth. And most people are derailed from the mission for one reason or another. They've bought into one illusion or another that has derailed them from performing the mission that they came here to perform, which is to lead a rebellion against slavery on a planet. I mean, there can be no greater mission than that, folks. And the brothers and sisters that we came here to perform that mission with, they're here. We are here. The question is, how many of us are actually doing the work of the mission versus sitting back and watching someone else? How many of us are actively involved in the battle plan versus sitting back and saying, oh, I see what you're doing, or I like what you're doing, or I don't like what you're doing. Well, instead of critiquing something, get on the battlefield, folks. You know, this has been my war cry for years and years now. It isn't about watching someone else do the work. It's about helping them do it. When we end this condition, that the trauma ultimately brought about and then perpetuated because we didn't engage in the healing dynamics of self-respect, remembering who we truly are, and then accepting our own individual personal responsibility to understand natural law and choose right action over wrong action. Okay? We allowed this condition of slavery to perpetuate itself. But when we do that personal introspective self-healing work, to take a look at ourselves again, recognize our infinite worth, accept who we really are, and accept the personal responsibility that comes with our natural inherent birthright of sovereignty. That's when we're going to be free, and that then and only then are we really going to truly exercise our birthright and step into the wider community of beings who also have gone through that transformative spiritual journey, recognize their own sovereignty and are existing and operating within that sovereignty within creation. And believe me, they're out there. Slide 183 and 4. They are out there in the cosmos. Not all the beings in the cosmos are like the beings that came to this planet and did what they did. But at the same time, they're not going to do that work for us because then we'll be their responsibility. You know, it'd be like them, you know, just taking on some kind of a uh, an animal species halfway in between, you know, a, an animalistic state and a human state. And they, they have their own work to do upon themselves. You know, they, they don't want 
us to be their responsibility. They want us to be responsible for us. That's what any good adult would want for a child. Not to constantly have to look after them and, you know, constantly provide for them even into their older years. They would want the child to have enough knowledge and confidence and self-respect and responsibility that they're going to engage in that for themselves. So no one's coming to rescue us from ourselves, folks. It's not going to happen. You're waiting for that? You have been duped. That's all I can say. All the talk about this group's coming to rescue us, the White Hats over here, the Andromedans, this space alien group, it's all nonsense. It always has been all nonsense. If you're waiting for that, you've been duped. We have to do this for ourselves. They don't want, the, these other beings that are out there don't want a species that can't take care of themselves out in the, in the wider galactic community or the wider universal community. We're going to be confined to the nursery that Earth is, to the prison that we've turned it into, until we develop that personal respect and responsibility as individuals. So, you know, when we do that, the heavens will welcome us. The very stars will welcome our presence. We don't want to do that work. It's going to be a long and painful journey down the left-hand path into the arms of Eris, the, the goddess of chaos, who will gladly assist us in our further teaching. I, for one, would hope that people would cho choose the direct path that leads to the arms of Isis, the goddess of truth, you know, and then helps us to understand who we really are, what our real worth is as individuals, and that knowledge and understanding will help guide us to wisdom, which is right action. And when we do that, we end slavery here and then we'll be welcomed by the wider community that, you know, well, we can then learn and grow from together. So, you know, to me, that's all there really, that really needs to be said to wrap this up. And that's the end of, you know, my uh, formal presentation on cosmic abandonment in the extended of variation. I do want to revisit this topic in the future soon, you know, maybe even interspersed within other shows that I'm going to be doing on the topics I already mentioned earlier, um, just to, um, you know, bring out some source material and read some things from different ancient texts that will help people to understand this information's been out there since time immemorial. And if you read these texts it, with the knowledge that we've already covered in these presentations, you see it in a whole new light. And then things start to really make sense to you. And there are some very important things within those ancient so-called sacred texts. We'll get into